So lots of the activities that we feature on Explore the Shore require nice low tide and good sea conditions. But something you can do on absolutely any day is to walk along the beach and pick up things that have been washed ashore. We spend and quite a lot of time doing that. Well, it's great <laughs> like, fun to do this. this. What's this? So that's what's known as beach combing. So you just wander along the drift line and actually the rougher the conditions and the fewer other people there are around, the better things you tend to find. More than washes so, up here. So you can do it any day, any type of weather, any state of the tide and you'll find something interesting to take a look at. Especially after storms, right? There's after a storm is actually, or during a storm, is actually the best time. So if you walk along the beach when it's raining or something, then you might find like a paper nautilus oh, yeah. because there's nobody else around to pick it up. So let's walk along this nice piece of beach on the west coast here and see what we can find. And go, what's that, Charles? What's that? <laughs> One of the most common things that you find on the seashore on the west coast is the carapaces or the shells of rock lobsters that have molted. And this doesn't mean that the rock lobster has died. The rock lobster, in fact, has to molt its old suit of armor, its old shell, in order to grow. And it's actually had to withdraw the, the eye tissue down that little stalk there. So it has to be very kind of soft. It has to be able to pull its antennae back through these little constricted joints here. So the whole thing is very floppy when it's molted. So the animal opens like this in between the, the tail and the head part, the carapace, and then pulls itself out the two halves. So it comes out that gap there. So it loses the old shell, then it pumps itself up and it has a new soft shell underneath. And it pumps itself up to a larger size and then that new shell hardens and it has a new suit of armor the next size up, you know, loses its two to three year old clothing and gets into its three to four year old clothing. And then that shell hardens and it lives in that one for another six months or a year and then develops another larger shell underneath that. So the fact that you find these uh, shells on the seashore doesn't mean that there's been a lobster mortality. These lobsters are still swimming perfectly happily there out in the sea and this is just discarded out of fashion last year's clothing. <laughs> and crabs operate exactly the same way. So this little crab here is called the sad-faced crab. It looks like it's got two little eyes and a sad looking face. But I like to call it the happy-faced crab. I just turn it the other way around so it's got a nice big smile on its face. And this works exactly the same way. So you'll see many shells of these washed up on the beach at particular times of the year. And that just means it's the molting season. So the crab will construct um, a new shell underneath the old one. And then when it loses its old shell, it also gets a nice new suit. They often get little mussels and things growing in the eye stalks here. And then by molting, they can get rid of those mussels before they start to cause any problem. This actual crab is still out there in the sea, probably as happy as anything. Ah, here's a nice one. What do you find? So this is a cuttle bone. So this is the buoyancy structure of a cuttlefish. Cuttlefish are related to squid and octopus, but octopus don't have any shells at all. And squid have a thing called a pen. It's a very thin little um, plastic-like looking that, like the, the center of a feather. It doesn't provide a lot of buoyancy, but it gives the animal some structure. But a cuttlefish has this flotation device. It's its little life vest. <laughs> so by adjusting the amount of fluid in this polystyrene-like structure here, then it can maintain its buoyancy so it's floating exactly, okay. mutually buoyant in the water. It's like so it a weight belt. Like a weight belt, it doesn't have to use any energy to go up and down in the water. If it starts to sink, it just pumps some more buoyant fluids into the spaces here and raises itself slightly. And if it starts to go too high, it pumps them out again. So 
it can maintain itself at exactly the same level in the water with absolutely no energy. And these are the things you collect and feed to your canary. <laughs> It ends up actually, in a budgie's cage, but actually far cooler than that. In the budgie cage, yeah. So you've got a beautiful structure and it's very, very, very light. Always a lot of mussel shells. Cracked open, eaten. Oh, this one's got a hole in it. This one's got a hole in it. Oh, okay. One of the most common things that you'll see on the seashore here is hundreds and hundreds of mussel shells that are washed up. And the reason why these get washed up is mostly because of what we call self-thinning. So when the uh, mussels settle on the rocks as little juveniles, you can fit like 10,000 of them onto a square meter. But as they grow, then they take out, each individual takes up more and more space and they start to squeeze each other off the rocks. So when they're this kind of size, you can only fit maybe 500 or 1,000 onto a square meter. So of the original 100,000, 99% just get squeezed off and washed ashore. But some of them also get predated. So you'll find some mussels have a tiny little perfectly round hole in them. And that's made by a drilling whelk. It has an acid gland that it applies to the surface of the mussel shell to soften it and then it scrapes away the softened material and gradually makes a hole right through the shell. Then it sticks its feeding proboscis, which is like the hose of a vacuum cleaner, through the shell and actually hoovers out some of the meat of the mussel. And many of those mussels die, but because the tissue just inside the shell is mostly gonad, some of them actually survive. So occasionally you'll see a mussel shell that has a drill hole that it's repaired, and then another drill hole's been made next to it, and that okay. one's been fatal. So it just depends where the drill hole's been made, whether the mussel dies or not. Another reason why mussels get washed up is that seaweeds start to grow on them, and then as the seaweeds grow, they exert more and more of a force in the waves. And eventually, when the piece of seaweed gets big enough, it just pulls the mussel right off the, the rocks. So many of the washed up mussels that you'll find are actually attached to large pieces of seaweed and they've been uprooted. They've been yanked off the rock by their seaweed friends. It's like your hair gets too big and then just pulls your... Just pulls your whole body off, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, there's a whole selection of different uh, gastropods that are washed up here. So most of what you see are mussels and there are a couple of different species here. There's the ribbed mussel, there's the black mussel, and then uh, this is the bisexual mussel, which, which is an introduced species to this part of the coastline. And there's a lot of like snails and things. And then these are all drilling whelks, being eupina. There are several different species here. Oh, there's a pretty one. Look at this one with this amazing ridges on it. It's another thing, of course, that you can do on the drift line here when you're beach combing is just to collect different species of shells. And uh, many shell collectors just gather their material from, from the beach drift like this. I'm sure there are lots of limpets here too. See it. Oh, there's a limpet. Okay, so this is the kelp limpet, the limpet that lives exclusively on the stalks of sea bamboo, the big kelp. And its body is bent, the shell is bent to fit onto the uh, to fit on the stalk of the kelp plant. Uh, here we've got a couple of pieces of sponge like that. This is a really nice typical piece. So it was attached to this mussel originally, and then when the mussel got pulled up, the sponge came with it. And they're squishy like a bath sponge. You can, most of them are soft, and most of them have these little holes along the outer margin. So there are many different species of sponge that get washed up, and they have all sorts of different characteristics. But this is a really nice, typical one. You can see these big holes in the end of the sponge which it pumps the water out. So the sponge sucks in water over the whole surface of its body and then pumps it out of larger holes that tend to be at the top end of the body. 
Is it filtering? Yeah? It's filtering out very fine particles like bacteria out of the water. A very sedentary life, just yeah, hanging yeah. out on the bottom of the They're ocean. very, very simple animals. I mean, they're only a few different cell types and they're no different tissues. So it doesn't have a mouth or a stomach or intestines or a heart or a reproductive system. Just pieces, cells just break off and then they'll grow again into another sponge. Amazing. So you can actually put a sponge through the mincer <laughs> and then Big it'll grow into, into lots of little baby sponges again. So you'll find lots of sponges of many different species on the seashore, on That's the drift line. Uh, a big bone? Sure. Okay, there are lots and lots of dead seals being washed up on this beach and there's many seal bones sitting around. So this is the scapula of a seal bone, it's the shoulder blade okay. of the seal bone. And there's quite a few other different bones lying around. I can see the whole remains of a, of a seal actually in front of us here. So let's take a look at some of the other bits. And here's a piece of the jaw with still the rather broken large canine teeth at the front. So Seals are carnivores, so they've got the big canine teeth like a dog. And that's still in place, the teeth behind it have been lost. <clears throat> and then this is a neck vertebra. So the skull rests against this vertebra and then can rotate against these flat plates here. So this is the first vertebra of the vertebral column. And actually a few other vertebrae also lying around here. Now here's, here's something interesting. <laughs> What did you find? Yeah, this rather pretty rock here is a piece of the reef of a reef worm. So the reef worms make these large reef, reefs made out of sandy tubes. And when then they break up and get swished around on the beach, they get polished and uh, rounded like this and, and make rather attractive little decorative rocks. Are there any stones? There's more about them in our polychaete worms episode. So these are filter feeders that make big reefs on the on the shore and the sandy areas on the west coast. Mm -hmm.